Hello, welcome again to one of our online lectures. Uh, today's subject is going to be something I call the Northern Renaissance, and then we'll also talk about something called the Reformation. Um, but I want to start with this phrase, the Northern Renaissance, uh, and start with a caveat about its relative inaccuracy. Nevertheless, uh, I want to give some reasons why uh, we, we use it. Um, let me uh, go to a map just to start off with to try to help explain some things. So when we talk about the Northern Renaissance, we're going to be talking about, we saw in the Italian Renaissance, we were largely down here, of course, in Italy. Uh, and the Northern Renaissance, we're going to go look up here in Northern Europe. It's going to cover regions, uh, if we looked at at least a map today, would say probably Germany and Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, but the northern kind of edge of Europe up in here is where we're going to be spending our time. Now, uh, let's talk about why it's totally an inaccurate phrase, and then we'll talk about it, why we use it. Um, if you remember from the Medici documentary and from our Renaissance lecture, the word Renaissance means something. It means rebirth. And when you're talking about a rebirth, of course, something have, has to have been alive before to be reborn. And the thing which was being reborn in the Italian Renaissance was the classical past, uh, the heritage of ancient Greece and Rome, which had been suppressed by the uh, Catholic Church for over a thousand years, was coming back, was being reborn. And we saw that in artistic styles, we saw it in the ideas which were being reborn, you know, philosophers like Socrates and Plato, mathematicians like Pythagoras, if you've ever heard of the Pythagorean theorem, uh, the guy who invented that. It wasn't just the art that was suppressed, but it was all those ideas as well. All those things were deemed pagan and evil by early Christians and had been essentially forced underground for over a thousand years. Though that was reborn, and that's what inspired the Italian Renaissance or rebirth. Now, when we go to the north, the reason the word renaissance is totally inaccurate is there is no technical rebirth occurring up there. It's not like there was something that happened in their past that was being reborn. And specifically, they especially weren't having a rebirth of the classical past. The classical past was not something that was part of their heritage. Um, before the era of modern transit, where you can hop on a train or a plane and get from the Netherlands to, and to Italy in a few hours, um, it was very difficult. There was very little contact between these two places, and they didn't know much about ancient Greece and ancient Rome because uh, it wasn't part of their heritage. So it definitely wasn't a rebirth of the classical world like it was it down in Italy. Um, therefore, the term Renaissance is totally inaccurate. Yet, we use it for a couple reasons. One is that uh, in the generic sense, the word Renaissance has come to just signify something totally new, something that wasn't there before being there. In that generic sense of very new things happening in very dramatic ways that shape history and culture, the North was having a Renaissance in that sense. And it was happening at almost exactly the same time that the Italian Renaissance was occurring. Therefore, it does make a little bit of logical sense, both because it matches in time and the general idea of just something new is happening up in the north. So that's why we call it the Northern Renaissance. Okay, um, so I want to take a chance today, we want to draw some lines between what was happening in the Italian Renaissance and what's happening in the Northern Renaissance. We'll see some similarities, but we'll see a lot of differences, and I want to try to account for those. And I want to use this painting as a kind of starting point to explore some of these similarities and differences. This is an artist named Campan, and this is an altarpiece called the Marode Altarpiece. An altarpiece, of course, is kind of what it sounds like. It's a big painting that would be placed at the altar or the front of a, a church for people to look at and contemplate. Um, frequently, altarpieces are done in multiple panels. You can see here um, these little lines. These are actually essentially points of hinging in between these three separate panels and uh, you have kind of three little points of a story going on. And we'll see a number of these altarpieces today, a very common format for artists to paint in, especially the most famous and best artists of the era. Uh, 
So let's look at this scene and let's see what seems the same and what seems new and different here. In the same category, let's say religion is still the dominant force behind the creation of art. When we were in the Italian Renaissance, we saw a couple exceptions to that with things like uh, The Birth of Venus by Botticelli. That being said, as you saw in the documentary and in the lecture, most of the art that's being made during the Italian Renaissance has religion at its basis. Um, it is religious in subject, and it is being commissioned for very specific religious purposes. Now that might be, it's being commissioned by the Pope for a church or the Vatican. That might mean it's being commissioned by a local bishop uh, for uh, a local church. It could mean that a wealthy person is commissioning the art as a way of kind of buying forgiveness of their past sins. We saw that in the Italian Renaissance too. So regardless of who you are, if you're commissioning art in this era, frequently it has a religious kind of subject matter like we have here and a religious intent in its purpose to either inspire others to be more religious or to sort of buy forgiveness of sins. So in that sense, this is very similar. The Catholic Church, the word Catholic means universal. And at this time in 1426, if you were a Christian in Europe, you were basically Catholic. It was the universal Christian church. We're going to see that change by the end of today's lecture, but at this point in time, if you're Christian, you're Catholic, whether you're living in Northern Europe or whether you're living in Rome. Now, it's a, it's a little different um, being that far away from the center of the church, but nevertheless, you're still Catholic and, and believe very seriously, usually, in the belief, in the theology of the Catholic Church. So that's very similar. Let's get down to, though, what has happened in the art and look at some very new things happening. Let's... The first thing you might notice is that in this painting, there is not a very convincing sense of three-dimensional space. Uh, if we look at something like this bench that goes back, it does get smaller as it goes back, as things tend to do when our eyes perceive them, but it's going back at a very sharp, odd angle. It doesn't look right. It looks like the floor is tilted way up. Uh, and in the same way, this table, maybe the best example, it looks like this front leg is probably two feet shorter than wherever the back leg is, because it appears to us that the table is sort of standing up and all these objects should be sliding off of it kind of into the foreground and falling down here. Um, remember, the Italian Renaissance was not only a rebirth of visual styles in art, but of ideas. And those things collided in something like one-point perspective. Remember, that's the, mathematic, the mathematical theory that allows you to use geometry as a kind of basis and create a sense of three-dimensional depth in a painting, in a two-dimensional flat surface. You make it look like it has depth. They know, again, the general idea, things get smaller as they go in the distance. I mean, these buildings out the inside the window here are smaller than inside. They don't know the mathematical formula. They don't have that part of the Renaissance in uh, their lives. Therefore, they just kind of guess. It's, it's a kind of guesswork perspective, which usually doesn't work very well. So they don't have that aspect of the Italian Renaissance, and therefore we lose that sense of illusionary space. On the other hand, though, this painting uh, is much more convincing of reality in some ways than a lot, than really anything you would see in the Italian Renaissance. I'm going to come up close uh, a detail on this central panel to give you a, a little better sense of this. Uh, this is the series of scene of the Annunciation. If you hadn't guessed, you have Mary sitting down. And sorry, it's a little disconnected here. Let me go back. Uh, Mary sitting down. The angel Gabriel coming to tell her that she's going to bear the Christ child. Um, these are the donors, the people that paid for the painting. They like to get themselves in there, as we've seen before. And this is uh, Joseph, the person Mary will eventually marry. But I want to focus on this central panel here. And we'll see a few things uh, that are unique. One of the things that's different here, well, let's say two things, uh, they, and they kind of go together, is the, the color and the amount of detail which is used in this painting. 
um, the one of the things, maybe the most important thing they have in the North that they don't have in the early eras of the Italian Renaissance is they have an entirely new technology when it comes to art. And that technology is oil paint. Um, when you paint, you take pigment. You saw this in the documentary, and you grind up the pigment. But you have to mix the pigment in with a substance, uh, uh, a binder that kind of keeps it together that becomes your paint. Uh, in Italy, during the Italian Renaissance, frequently you use things like egg yolks. Um, you would use the pigment and kind of paint directly into plaster uh, in a fresco painting, which we've talked about. Uh, oil paints, though, offer the artist two, well, a few very powerful things. One is the colors, when you put those pigments in oils, are much more intense than when you mix them with things like egg yolks or paint into wet plaster where the colors become kind of dulled down. So in that sense, the oil paints here allow you to create much more realistic and lifelike, vivid, dramatic colors. Uh, we live in a world in which color is a very prominent, powerful thing, and these paintings captured the colors of the real world much more intensely than Ita Italian Renaissance painters tended to do. The other thing oil paints allow you to do is oil paints dry very slowly, and they allow you to constantly layer oil paints. Uh, you can paint and then paint over that and then over that and over that, and you can always be going back and adding more and more and more detail to the point that it becomes almost like obsessive compulsive in a lot of these paintings. The, the time spent with these artists to paint things like this angel's hair uh, some of these artists, Campan and a few we'll look at today, were renowned for painting with single-haired paintbrushes. You know, a, a paintbrush is a collection of um, hairs, horse hair, or some different kind of hair. Uh, they would have a brush that was made with nothing but one horse hair, so they could paint the most minute of details in their paintings. So the combination of the intense colors in the oil paint and the level of detail that these artists can achieve because of oil paint means that while the space itself doesn't look very convincing or realistic, when you zoom in on individual details, they look much more realistic than anything that was ever done in the Italian Renaissance. So if you zoom in on this vase of lilies, this porcelain is much more convincing than any porcelain you'd see painted. The, the hair of the angel, the robes of the angel and Mary, the paper in the book, the velvet of the cover, the candlestick, the brass pot back here, all these things, the towel, when you get up close, and this is a lecture that's sort of hard to do without being able to take you in front of actual paintings because I can only get so many good details, but you can probably get a sense already of there's a lot more detail and uh, convincing, realistic looking detail in this kind of a painting than what we saw in the Italian Renaissance. So the Italian Renaissance looks more convincing they're paintings from kind of a distance because you get a sense of space, but up close, these look much more intensely real. Now, the last thing I want to mention that is new here in the Northern Renaissance is all these little objects I've just gone through, the candlestick and the vase and the book and the brass pot and the towel. When you think about uh, paintings and sculptures in the Italian Renaissance, um, think about like uh, Michelangelo's David. He sculpts David, and David is holding a sling, because that's part of the story. But there's no other objects hanging around David. There's no, you know, things hanging out on the ground. It's just about David. In northern paintings, we get a lot of little objects, just stuff piled into the scenes. And the reason is that these people operated using a kind of visual symbolic language. Uh, on the first day, in our first lecture, I did a little exercise where I put up a picture of an eagle and I asked what it meant to you and you probably thought of ideas like America or freedom or liberty uh, ideas that really have very little to actually do with the eagle but we in our society read the eagle symbolically we see in the image something totally different than what the image actually is that's the way this culture operated and when they would have seen this brass pot hanging in the background they saw it as a symbol for the Virgin Mary the Virgin Mary was an, an empty, clean vessel to bear the Son of God, uh, just as that pot hanging in the background is an empty, clean vessel. 
Um, uh, I want to talk about a, a good one here is this uh, candlestick on the table. Now notice a couple things about it. First of all, that it's been snuffed out. It's not a candle that is burning. And second of all, that it had more candle to go, okay? It got snuffed out part way down. It still, the candle could have theoretically burned all the way down to the base, but it didn't. This is what is known as a vanitas symbol. And you spell that kind of like vanity, but with an A-S on the end, V-A-N-I-T-A-S. And these will be very common in the Northern Renaissance. We'll see these actually through a lot of art history. So it's a good thing to remember. A vanitas symbol is essentially a symbol that is that reminds somebody of the nature of death and life, and that life is a very temporary thing, and at any moment it could be snuffed out, it could be gone, you could be dead. Uh, therefore, you need to make sure you live your life good. Don't be vain, don't be selfish, don't be focused on the things of the world, be focused on perfecting your soul and preparing it to go to heaven rather than hell. And this candle, of course, is a good symbol for that because it was snuffed out, it is dead in essence, and it died before it expected to. It still had some time left, nevertheless it was snuffed out and it's dead. So it's a reminder that this, this candle could be you. You feel young, you feel vibrant, you have plenty of life to go, but at any moment you could get a car accident, get an illness, catch the plague if you're living during the Northern Renaissance. Um, so it's a reminder of the temporary nature of life and the need to live a good, pious, holy life while you're alive. So remember, two things here we've seen that are really distinct. Uh, the advent of a new technology in oil paint, which allowed for more intense colors and details, and then the kind of symbolic language that they operated. Everything in this painting, I haven't gone through all of them, but everything from these little carved elements on the furniture to uh, the absence of a candle here, the presence of one, and every little thing you see has a kind of symbolic meaning in the painting. Uh, and that's something that we'll see is very common in the North, which wasn't really a part of the Italian Renaissance. So I also want to look at a portrait by the same artist, Campan, and talk about, again, what's different about the North in contrast to the South, in contrast to Italy. And uh, portraiture is a really common form of art. There's portraits in almost any part of history where art is a part of society. Uh, but portraits are used very differently in the Northern Renaissance than they would have been in the Italian Renaissance. I'm going to put up a point of comparison um, here. And I'm not even giving you a name because I don't want you to be bothered with it. I want you to focus on the campan. But this is a classic portrait from the Italian Renaissance. Okay, uh, This is a portrait in Florence today. Uh, a double portrait of a husband and wife of a powerful family. You can think of like, you know, the Medici, a family like that, that is an important, powerful family in society. Now, think, I want you to think about yourself why you get your portrait painted. Um, we have our portraits splattered all over our society, and Facebook and uh, everywhere else you can imagine. And for us, it's as simple as pushing a button, so why not? But for these people... Getting your portrait painted was a very expensive endeavor. Um, to get your portrait painted by a famous artist would be, in our terms, maybe $10,000, maybe $50,000, maybe $100,000. So you've got to really want your portrait painted. Uh, and let's say that if you're spending $100,000 on getting your portrait painted, you're not getting it painted just because you think it would be fun to have a picture of yourself looking cool. Uh, you've got to have better reasons than that. Usually when you paid to have your portrait painted, it was because you wanted to very carefully fashion and articulate a distinct identity. You wanted to show it to other people and have them get very Im distinct, important ideas about you. Frequently, those ideas were things like, I am wealthy, I am powerful, I am important, I am wise. Um, you essentially want to self craft an image of who you are through your portrait. We do the same things today, even if it is something on what you choose for your profile picture on Facebook. We also craft our own identities through our images, but if your Facebook picture costs a hundred grand, you'd put a little more thought into it. Um, so this is a classic example here on the right of a husband and wife, powerful people. Frequently you have yourself painted in front of a landscape to connote the idea of this is what I rule over, this is what I'm in charge of. Uh, 
you have yourself dressed in your nicest clothes, especially the women over here. I mean, they're very fancy, elaborate. I don't know how you do that hairdo, but I'm assuming it takes many, many hours and lots of servants. Uh, you get dressed in your fanciest clothes, you put on your nicest jewels, um, and you pose. So you get a sense of power with the landscape. You get a sense of wealth uh, and luxury in the way you dress. Um, you also get a sense of power in just this format. Notice that um, they're done in profile. This is traditionally the pose you get on things like coins where rulers had themselves represented. Uh, even on a lot of our money, you get you know uh, profile images of people like Abraham Lincoln. It's a traditional thing that was done in ancient Greece and Rome where you put people like uh, Caesar Augustus on a coin, he's in profile. So it's this kind of regal, authoritative pose also. So that's what portraits usually are used for, to fashion an identity, usually an identity of power, wealth, strength, dominance, those kinds of ideas. Now when we come over here to our, can our portrait of a lady by Campan on the left, She's still, this would cost a lot of money. I should say, I'm going to go back to the big one here. This is probably smaller, actually, than what you're looking at on your computer screen. It's a very small painting. Yet, that makes it almost even more amazing because the level of detail that the artist paints this with is very, very intense. Um, and if we compare it to this Italian one, if you say, does that lady's face look more realistic or this lady's face? I'm guessing almost all of you are going to choose Campan's. Though Campan's is not much bigger than what you see on your screen, whereas this portrait over here is very large. So the first one we're dealing with the difference in scale. Nevertheless, it still would have been an expensive luxury object to have an artist like Campan paint your portrait. So she is just, she's wealthy too, and she could have painted herself to show off her wealth and her power, but she doesn't. She does something very different. So she is still trying to fashion and articulate an identity, but it's a very different kind of identity. It's a very dark background, so you don't have this kind of landscape. She's not claiming I rule or dominate over this countryside or this town. You get nothing but her face, her simple clothing, and her very pious kind of posture and look. Uh, and that is what she's wanting to articulate, is I am not the fanciest, most wealthy, powerful person in all of Germany. She's trying to say I am the... I am a very humble, simple, uh, kind, loving, pious person. The reason for this is that you saw in the documentary, one of the reasons I had you watch it is you saw that there was a lot going on in Italy at the time. Italy was a very exciting place, and a lot of that excitement came because of its position geographically in relation to the trade of the Middle East. The Medici were able to become very powerful bankers in part because they were on good trade routes in southern Europe. Uh, a lot of money to be made, a lot of money flowing through the towns. And it's also, of course, Rome, the seat of the Catholic Church. And, and you saw in the documentary, the Catholic Church is as much a political institution as it is a religious one in this era. So it's the kind of place where the most power is wielded. So in Italy, you've got money and power coming together in ways that make uh, for a lot of political gamesmanship. And frequently, uh, people would use art in order to kind of take their power, or their wealth, pardon me, and turn it into power. So you have people like the Medici commissioning Brunelleschi to build the dome on the Florence Cathedral, because they know if they do that, if they're the ones responsible for that, it means they have more political power in society. So the art is frequently used to those ends. In the North, this is not the same context. They're not on major trade routes. They don't have as much money flowing through. There aren't many families like the Bedici who are just making money. There is frequently a king, some kind of ruler, and there might be a few noble families who you know go back generations. But there wasn't a lot of movement. There wasn't a lot of people just rising up like the Medici and becoming very powerful because they became they figured out ways to become very wealthy. So society was much more stable in that regards, so and there wasn't as much need to have your portrait painted so that people thought you were really important and wealthy and whatever you wanted to articulate. What, there, what it was was a very religious society. And the way the identity you want to articulate is I'm a very religious good person. And that's what we see in this portrait. So both in its scale, it's more modest. Um, in the way, not that it's painted, but the way that it uh, things are you know, stripped away. It's very simple, very bare bones. 
yet painted with such intense beauty and reality that you absolutely know this woman. You recognize her if she walked in the room uh, and you would believe her probably to be pious simply because you've seen her in this uh, painting and in this pose. Okay, we go to uh, another painting by probably the most famous painter of the Northern Renaissance, a guy named Jan van Eyck. And this is where it gets truly frustrating uh, because he is uh, one of the greatest technical painters in history. Uh, when we're talking about just simple sheer skill, this guy is really, really amazing. Um, the level of detail he paints with is astounding and you almost never see it anywhere else in the history of art. So if, if your definition of a, a good painter is somebody who just paints with amazing levels of realistic detail, Jan van Eyck would be near the top of your list for the greatest artist of all time. Um, this is an altarpiece, we, again, so you can see right here, these are the hinges right there and right there, and these panels actually fold shut. Let me show you an image. Uh, this is of it in the process of being folded shut. You can just see the inside. And then there's paintings on the outside as well. So at different times of the year, you could close it and have it look different. And then you'd open it on certain occasions. Now, the other thing to just be keep in the back of your mind as we look at it and try to understand what people would have seen in it when they saw it originally uh, in the Northern Renaissance is originally it was positioned in this very dramatic gold and wooden frame that almost looks like a little church itself. So we don't have that frame today, but you have to sort of imagine that, that it would have made it even more dramatic and grand and impressive it was, if it was in the original frame. Now, I also want to give you a sense of scale here. This is a painting from the 19th century of the church in Ghent, where this altarpiece is located. Uh, and you can see that that frame I just mentioned doesn't still exist, but what this does do is it gives you a sense of how big this painting is. Uh, so these are people standing on the ground. If you look at, say, this central figure of God or this figure of Adam over here, there's at least a pretty close connection. They're close to what we would say life size. So if you stand down here and look up, God, Adam, uh, the angels, Mary, these figures are about the size of an actual human being where they took crawl up there and actually sit there. And that's going to be important because... Remember, this is an artist who paints things with unbelievable levels of detail. When you couple that detail with things being life-size, this would have been the kind of painting that definitely caused people to be absolutely convinced they were looking at something real. They were looking at God when they looked at it. So let's uh, zoom in and look a little closer at the painting. Now you can see there's this upper register which has larger scale figures and then at the bottom there's these multiple panels of smaller figures. I'm going to zoom in just on a few of the panels and talk about the ways in which the artist is getting uh, extremely near to uh, reality. I want to focus first on this panel up here with these angels singing. Um, now if we look at that, uh, you'll notice a lot of things. First of all, you start to see how amazingly painted all the details are. Uh, the robes, the jewelry, the woodwork, um, faces, hair, everything. Now you can see all the faces, they almost look like they're twins, right? That's because the artist, uh, the idea of angels, he was trying to make them all seem like they have, you know, they're unified, they're connected, they're the same kinds of beings. But there is something different about all of them. And that is their facial expressions, okay? Now this is meant to be an angelic choir. We've got music being played and they're all singing. And they all have different kind of looks on their face. Uh, a music scholar looked at this painting and kind of coupled with an art historian, they, uh, the music scholar tried to determine what notes the people were singing based on the positions of their mouths. And what the music scholar asserted is that you can actually see them singing harmony, like perfect harmonies. Um, what this suggests is that not only is the artist focused on making sure that robe looks like a very, very realistic looking gold threaded bejeweled robe, but that the artist is so interested in capturing precise reality that he studied actual choir singing and he recognized that people who are singing low notes tend to make different faces than those who are singing high notes. And he painted the literal faces these people had when they were singing in harmony. So a lot of attention to detail. 
I'm going to go down to this lower register now. Down here, we're going to look at this half of this panel. Um, so this is that half. Sorry, this is also, I'm going to conclude by going back up to the top. But this is that half of that panel. This is a kind of gathering of leaders and important people from all over the world. There's a symbolic lamb here on an altarpiece, symbolic of Christ. And then if we were to zoom in right here, that's what the detail is you're looking at here. So let's say that this is a very small portion on the canvas. It's probably no more than you know, a few inches across, yet the individuals down here are treated with just as much detail as anybody else. Uh, these, you know, their robes, their crowns, their scepters, their books, the jewels that reflect light uh, perfectly in every direction. Even when you get down, whether it's a few inches on the canvas or whether it's, you know, eight feet across, the same level of detail is put into it, and it's unbelievably impressive. I want to go up to the top register and look at the picture of Adam, which is on the left here, you can see labeled. And it, I want to draw some contrast again between uh, something we saw in the Italian Renaissance and this picture of Adam, which I just have a detail of his face right here, of course. This is Donatello's St. Mark we looked at. And remember, we talked about this one in a lot of ways, very realistic, anatomically, uh, perfectly proportioned. You have that contrapposto pose that we saw made popular in ancient Greece, where you have one part of the body in motion, one arm moving, one at rest, the torso facing one direction, the head facing the other. Um, so in some senses, a very realistic representation of the body. And something that, in all honesty, Jan van Eyck is not very good at. Uh, probably he didn't study f nude models very much. He definitely wasn't dissecting nude bodies like a lot of the Italian Renaissance artists were. And the anatomy over here is not perfect. Muscles aren't all in the exact right spot. It's a little bit off proportionally. Uh, and not only that, but the anatomy is much less perfect than anything you see. If you imagine like Michelangelo's David, this is not an, a, an idealized body where the muscles are all the perfect size, the face is perfect. Notice the big, you know, luxurious curls on the beard here in this face. But that's not really what faces look like, right? All the muscles might be in the same spot, but that face really looks kind of generic and not very real. In contrast, this anatomy might not be perfect, it might not be ideal, but when you get up close and look at that face, that face is much more close to reality than that face is. That face is a guy that if you see him on the street tomorrow, you will know him uh, very distinctly. It's not a generic face, it's a specific face. Even little details like, you know, he puts little tufts of hair on the guy's chest. Um, no Italian sculptors would ever dream of putting hair on Adam or David's chest. Uh, but because Jan van Eyck is not aiming for uh, something just generic, he's aiming for, or ideal, he's aiming for something very specific and realistic looking, you get details like that. And again, this beard is the kind of beard which is painted with... Things like a single-haired brush. So every hair in that beard is painted. It's not just carved to be kind of generic hair, but every strand of hair is individually painted. So again, anatomically, in some senses, not very realistic looking. Not ideal, but when you get up close, much more realistic than anything you'd see in Italy at the time. And the best example of that, I think, is the central figure of God which is one of simply the most amazingly beautiful things ever painted. Every little detail uh, painted with the utmost reality. You get a real sense of the difference between human flesh and fabric falling. It's kind of painting that makes you think if I could touch it, I should be able to feel texture as I rub my fingers across those jewels and across the robe and across skin and hair. All those things look unbelievably realistic with this a uh, glass scepter that you can see through in a very convincing illusion. Uh, I've given you a couple details here of the crown up here. You see how every jewel properly reflects the light as if it's coming from the one source, just as it tends to do in the real world. Uh, but everything painted, you can even as you go up, if you look at this robe, if you could see it in person, you can see they literally paint the, the threads that have been woven into the robe. And then the thing which to me always puts it over the top is actually not the figure, but it's the background. I would think if you're putting this much work into God, you would take a break and just kind of put like a blue curtain or something behind him. But instead, the artist goes to still unbelievable lengths to paint this 
really complex repeating pattern in gold as if it was woven onto this uh, piece of cloth behind God. So really, really intense levels of detail. And again, remember that this figure is almost exactly life-size too. And you would have to th imagine in the 1400s when you very rarely, most of the art you've still seen for most of your life looks kind of like art you saw in the medieval era. And it wasn't very realistic at all. When a guy like Jan van Eyck comes along and makes paintings like this and makes things look this realistic uh, in this scale, perfectly life-size, um, it's not hard to imagine that these people would have absolutely been convinced they were looking at God, that this was a real being and not just some kind of imaginary presence or unknowable mystic force, but that this was a person because it simply looks so much like a person. And I uh, bring in this painting that I showed you the very first day of class and started with in this class. This painting on the right by Rene Magritte questions, I think, that gap between art and reality and whether or not art offers us reality, uh, convinces us of reality, even if reality isn't there. Uh, or maybe it is there, we just don't know, but the art has art has the capability to convince us of things being very real. And I think Jan van Eyck is a perfect example of an artist who did that in history. Okay, I want to shift gears here and talk about another uh, northern artist who is in some ways very similar, has oil paints and similar technologies, but does some new things too. This is Roger van der Weyden's uh, deposition from a few years after Jan van Eyck. Uh, a very traditional subject matter when you'll find all over the place in the history of art. Uh, Christ coming down from the cross, uh, usually called a, a deposition scene, his body being deposed. Um, first off, a couple things. We have again these voile paints, very intense uh, colors, the red robe uh, here on the left, the blue uh, kind of robe that Mary wears, uh, some very bright, intense colors uh, separating it. Notice that that thing that was so important for Southern artists in the Italian Renaissance, perspective, depth, and space, and landscape. Uh, here, it's as if the crucifixion is taking place with a giant wall behind it, as if it's inside a church or something like that. This is in large measure because these artists don't understand perspective, Depth and space is not something they do well. So sometimes you get people like Roger van der Weyden just putting a big wall right where you should have a kind of landscape behind it. Um, he's not that interested in space and depth. What he is interested in and what he does uh, much more effectively than artists in the Italian Renaissance at this time, until maybe we get to somebody like Leonardo da Vinci who isn't really painting now still for another 50 years, um, is he creates very intense dramatic emotions, both through facial expressions and through gestures. Um, I want to zoom in uh, a little bit here uh, in just a moment. So note the difference here in these two paintings. These are basically the same subject. Uh, one timed a little bit after with the body of Christ coming down from the cross, the other with Christ hanging on the cross. But notice the stark difference here. Uh, with Masaccio's Holy Trinity, there is a clear illusion and sense of actual space, of depth, uh, of a two-dimensional surface that reads as a three-dimensional surface. Um, none of that in Roger van der Weyden's deposition. That being said, um, there is a kind of photographic quality, a kind of realism that the oil paints uh, a van der Weyden approach, which the uh, fresco of Masaccio doesn't really get anywhere near. Um, it might have the illusion of depth and space, but not for a second does anybody looking at the painting think those are actual people. Whereas in stark contrast, you might not believe this is an actual scene of Christ coming down from the cross on your right, largely because there's a big gold on the wall behind it. But those faces and those bodies um, look like people. Um, they look like individuals, um, and their emotions enhance that. Uh, as we get up close, um, the woman uh, on your left here, tears rolling down her face, her hand 
uh, raises in the air to blot her eyes. Uh, the woman on the right here, um, it's more about gesture, kind of wringing her hands together, her arms writhing. You get then a range of expressions with uh, Joseph of Arimathea here, um, more kind of concern and sorrow. Uh, so Van der Ryden is really trying to introduce every possible emotion he can imagine through both gesture and facial expression into this scene um, so that it becomes something that no matter what type of person you are, no matter what type of emotional response you might have to something like looking at an image of Christ on the cross, there's basically somebody in the scene that kind of mirrors you, somebody who you as an individual can connect with. Uh, and that's what he's really trying to do, is make this scene something that it may not look real in that you imagine this is actually how it looked because there was no gold wall behind it, but the emotions they feel and the way those are conveyed uh, become extremely realistic to people. I want to talk about uh, a couple more northern artists. Uh, one, uh, a guy named Albrecht Dürer. Uh, Dürer was uh, both a painter and a printmaker. Uh, printmaking is a type of art uh, some of you may be familiar with, some may not. Essentially, before the era of copy machines, if you wanted to have something copied, uh, you had to make a print. Um, this is uh, usually done uh, through a process called uh, engraving. Uh, where you take a metal plate, usually made of copper, and kind of dig into it with a harder metal kind of needle, and then you'd allow ink to settle in the divots created where you engraved, and you'd run it through a, a press that would shove this metal plate and a piece of paper close together, and the next thing you know, you would have um, an image. Um, it's a lot harder than it sounds, or I don't know if it sounds hard, it, it is hard, and Durer was better at it than about anybody in history. Um, He's also very good at making uh, woodblock prints, which is you just take a flat piece of wood and you carve out areas, and wherever you carve out, you get white, and wherever you leave it uh, becomes black, basically like a big stamp. Um, uh, he's really good at both methods of printmaking. Um, but I want to bring this one in for a few reasons. Uh, first off, uh, we saw in the Italian Renaissance there was this drawing together of God and man, this emphasis on life as an important time that God values and that he wants us to become educated and to learn and to study uh, nature, to dissect bodies, understand how the human body works, to try to understand this world, and that life was an important and valuable time for God's creations. In the North, there's a much greater sense of life is really about kind of preparing for the next life, and that's about all there is to it. We saw this a little bit in the first image we talked about in relation to camp, uh, sorry, in relation to the Northern Renaissance. We looked at that altarpiece called the Maraud Altarpiece by Campan. And if you remember, there were a bunch of symbols in that painting, and one of those symbols was a candle that's been snuffed out. And I talked about how that's a, a symbol for the temporary nature of life, that at any moment, you could be snuffed out just as this candle would. Um, that's something known as a vanitas symbol. You spell that V-A-N-I-T-A-S if you want to write it down. Uh, a vanitas symbol is any symbol that alludes to the, the transitory nature of life, the uh, kind of foolishness of investing yourself in the vain things of the world, in intellectual pursuits or you know, money or business or uh, possessions, anything that might tie you to this world, Vanitas symbols try to remind you that it's more important that you spend your life preparing for the afterlife, that you make sure you get in the heaven line rather than the hell line, essentially. Um, we see here, this is a, a classic Vanitas painting that is full of Vanitas symbols all over the place. I'm going to back up real quick and show you one in Van der Weyden's deposition. Notice on the ground here, as Mary falls down, there's this skull hanging out here. Um, that is a, a vanitas symbol, in probably the most obvious sense, right? It's one thing to say, I see a snuffed out candle, and that leads to the transitory nature of life. When you have a skull just lying there, it's an ever-present reminder that that was somebody who was alive one time, and they thought they'd live forever too, and pretty soon, 
um, that's going to be you, whether it's tomorrow or in a few years, either way, that is going to be you someday. Um, we, again, in Durer's painting, get our little skull hanging out on the ground here, you see on the bottom left. Um, but there's a number of other Vanitas uh, symbols as well. First of all, we have at the central scene this knight on horseback, uh, looking very powerful, strong, covered in armor. His horse is a strong, powerful animal marching down the road. Uh, he has a massive kind of lance. He has a sword tied to his hilt. He is uh, well guarded. And in this kind of an era, if you're fighting with that kind of armor, you're probably going to be okay, the Ahatz are, because there's a lot of people, most of the people you fight against don't have that kind of armor, which means you have a huge advantage in battle. So he is as well protected as you can be. Yet Durer Plate creates this scene where there are other figures lurking. You can see from the title, we know where the knight is, but we also have uh, Death, which is this figure back here with snakes kind of crawling out of his hair. Uh, he's symbolic of death, and then, if you didn't notice this kind of psychotic-looking, demonic, uh, beastly thing back here, that is the devil. Um, so, as he prances along with his horse, you can see he's totally oblivious to their presence. He doesn't know that death and the devil are kind of lurking there. But notice what death holds in his hand. He holds an hourglass. This is another one of those Vanitas symbols. Uh, pretty overt, right? Time is running out and eventually you are going to die. Um, Death also rides a horse, but a much more scraggly looking horse whose head comes down here in stark contrast to the noble head of this steed. Uh, but either way, you um, are, it doesn't matter if you have all this armor, it doesn't matter your lance, you can see a, a castle up on the hill he is probably theoretically riding towards. Uh, despite your fortifications, your walls, your armor, your horse, your lance, your sword, all those things, uh, don't they don't matter at all when death is concerned. He will come and claim you when he wants you. And uh, apparently there is some danger that with the devil lurking that when death comes to claim you, you won't be going to the good place. Um, I'm going to show you this painting, uh, sorry, this print again uh, a little later in the lecture, but I'm going to leave it for now uh, and come, come back to it a little bit. Uh, one, I just wanted to show you a painting also by Albert Durer um, uh, of St. Jerome. And if you didn't buy the fact that throwing a skull on the ground was symbolic of you need to prepare for death, this painting, I think, says it pretty clearly. Uh, St. Jerome, who kind of stares you down and puts his finger on the skull and is clearly gesturing to have you remember this on the background behind him. We have an, a, a little crucifix uh, with Christ on our cross. He is, has got his Bible open, and he is trying... This painting is all about reminding you that this could be you any day, so you better shape up, essentially. And I just want to point out, again, the difference between that conception of what life is about and what we got in the Renaissance in Italy. Um, if you remember the creation of Adam uh, by Michelangelo, here we have this intense gap which has existed for a long time between God and man really being broken down. That God and man have a kinship. That God uh, cares about granting life to man. This isn't about... A uh, Michelangelo scene is, is not at all about thinking about death. It's about thinking about life, about the present as something that matters and that, that God is interested in. Whereas in the North... They're much more invested in life being a very temporary thing that uh, will be ending and you better prepare for what's to come. We will see that image created more vividly in this next painting than ever before in the history of art and probably ever since as well. Uh, this is uh, Hieronymus Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights. Now, it probably... If I say that this is the most dramatic presentation of the transitory nature of life uh, ever, it probably doesn't seem like that at the moment. But that's because what you're looking at is an altarpiece. We've seen a few of these already, and if you remember, altarpieces uh, kind of have wings that fold close. So what you're looking at now is actually the altarpiece in its closed state, where you have this kind of orb uh, and this 
if you can see this, uh, some of the details on this land inside the orb, like it's this planet, there's some weird stuff going on. There's odd shapes that don't seem to reflect the natural world, but seem to be kind of made up things. But I promise if that seems odd to you, it will be getting much more odd in a moment. I should say Bosch is an artist from the north um, in Northern Europe, but this is a commission he's given uh, to do to make this painting by the King of Spain. Uh, Spain is an interesting place. We'll talk about it more next class. Uh, it, it's, it's in the south of Europe in that it's down kind of by Italy, but it is much like Northern Europe in that it is a very, very Catholic place, very strictly religious, much more strict than um, Italy, and much more like in the north. Uh, if you've ever heard of things like the Spanish Inquisition, um, the Inquisition has appeared in history where they tried to question people who might be preaching things that were outside the um, kind of confines of religion and then frequently imprisoning or killing those people. Uh, so a very strict Catholic place. And so when sometimes when those kind of people need good art, they go up to Northern Europe where there's also a lot of good strict Catholics. So uh, this is what Bosch paints for the king. I'm going to open the wings now and you'll see what we got. I'm guessing not what you expected from our generally kind of black and white, uh, very neutral wings. You open up to a scene bursting with color and hundreds and hundreds of figures, um, crazy architectural formations, crazy landscape formations, invented animals, and a lot of just odd stuff. Um, let me kind of walk you through this. So this is an altarpiece. It has three uh, panels. Let's start over here on the left. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, let's start on the left. Uh, and you see Adam and Eve with God. Now, this isn't that odd. Starting with an Adam and Eve uh, panel seems relatively normal. Um, but this is not your standard Garden of Eden. You can see that not only is it filled with very odd things like our pink fountain uh, formation in the middle and the mountains in the distance and some rather odd animals but right up in the front you have essentially a giant pool of black sludge out of which various creatures crawl and many of these creatures don't look like any animal that anybody's ever seen in the natural world this might this is probably alluding to the fact that what we have here is not the garden of eden in its perfect state this is the garden of eden after Adam and Eve have partake, partaken of the forbidden fruit, which caused what is known as the fall, meaning then uh, when lions and lambs used to lie down together and everybody got along, after the fall, things started to go sour. And so this painting is really much more about things going sour, and that black pool probably alludes to that. Uh, but where things really get sour is here in the central panel, which is essentially representing the present day, meaning... 1505 to 1510. What's going on in the world right now? Um, so a couple things. Uh, just to start in the background, we have this these four rivers flowing into a central pool uh, and a number of uh, kind of odd, again, architectural fountain and, and buildings and various odd things um, that I'm not going to too deep into their oddness. Uh, but just to say that these four rivers coming together is symbolic of the four corners of the earth. So this this panel is trying to make an argument that this is the world. This is kind of a universal problem. You even get um, people of different races. If you look down here in the front, you'll see people with different skin colors. Again, this is an attempt to say this isn't just about you know Spain right now or the Netherlands right now. This is about the world uh, and its issues. And it clearly has some issues. Uh, so, this is the kind of painting that you could spend hours looking at, and some art historians have, and try to explain everything that's going on. I'm going to try to give you a kind of Reader's Digest version and point out a few odd things. I mean, we have people hanging out inside a kind of fruit-like structure here with a giant blackberry in their hand that a bunch of people are eating. You got a guy turned upside down here with something in between his legs. Some people in this odd orb thing going for a ride, a guy peeking out of it, this guy is trapped in a clam. Um, you got people carrying giant fish, you have lots of giant birds walking around, uh, people eating giant strawberries. Um, I think I have a few 
a closer view of this central scene. Um, let's say that there's a lot of weird stuff going on in, in an, to keep it short and sweet. Um, a few things to say. Uh, one is that a lot of these things, um, art historians have gone back and found, one of the things that was popular at the time were little stories, little kind of parables uh, about, that would teach kind of moral lessons. So, you know, it'd be like, he who gets trapped inside the clam is in big trouble. I don't know, something stupid like that. Um, and you'd have that here. Oh, I love this one, I forgot, because you have the rat coming down like the tube to eat this guy's face, like the torture chamber. Um, but a lot of these images, um, people sitting around eating fruit, floating on odd things, connect to little parables at the time. So a lot of them would, be, would have been things that people would have been familiar with, and they would have basically seen these little stories pictured. Um, but there's so many weird things going on. Not all of them are that way. The artist is clearly inventing his own little parables also and doing some crazy stuff. Um, a couple of things that are consistent, you get um, fruits, uh, a lot of fruits around, strawberries particularly. Strawberries are another one of these Vanitas symbols because, as you know, if you ever buy strawberries, <laughs> I lament, every time I buy strawberries, I get home, and if you wait more than, like, two minutes, half of them are bad, and if you wait a couple days, you know, they're all bad. They're a fruit that uh, starts decaying rather rapidly after you pick it, uh, which, of course, connects pretty easily to Vanitas symbols that, you know, they have a very temporary short life. Um, there's a lot of birds in the scene. You see how these birds lined up back here? Uh, the, this guy's hugging the owl right there. Uh, the, the word bird in Dutch, which is, uh, the language that, uh, the artist spoke at the time, um, could be used as a kind of euphemism for sex. So, uh, it's one of those words that, uh, can be, is, is a regular word and then you can say it in a different context and it has totally different meanings. So that might be, there's clearly, I mean, everybody is nude, if you hadn't noticed, uh, which frequently connects with the idea of kind of sexual debauchery and sexual freedom. Uh, and when you couple that with all these giant birds, um, that might enhance that message of kind of sexual debauchery. And when you stick flowers up some guy's butt, it's even worse, I guess. I don't know. Anyhow, there's a lot of weird stuff going on, let's say. Um, but, as you might guess, since he's a really strictly Catholic artist, I'll go back to show you the whole thing here for a second, uh, painting all these sins and people acting frivolous and terrible and ridiculous um, would not be good Catholic art unless you couple that in the end with what happens to all these people in the next life, and that's what we get here. This is the hell panel. This is all those people participating in all those things in the middle, this is what eventually happens to them. Uh, and it's not so pretty. In fact, it's rather terrible. Um, I brought in a little detail of this section down here. You can see enlarged over here. And you have a giant kind of bird monster thing that is eating people. Uh, he is then, he's on this kind of throne toilet. He is then crapping these people out and they fall down into a pool of black sludge, you can see down here, into which people are vomiting and crapping out money. Uh, you have this nude woman here with some demon with its arms wrapped around here, some guy staring out the backside of another demon figure. Uh, you get, uh, if you look over here in the larger scene, people crucified on musical instruments. Musical instruments uh, frequently were also vanitas symbols. Um, because music is associated with kind of wasting away your life, you know, dancing and music, rather than being at home and praying and helping the poor and doing things you're supposed to do as a good Christian. It was seen as kind of a frivolous thing. So this guy uh, carrying this giant um, musical instrument, this guy crucified on the harp, um, those are traditional Vanitas symbols. Um, and then you not only have, with all these details, crazy stuff going on, but this hellish landscape in the distance. I mean, very apocalyptic looking with everything on flames, uh, smoke covering everything, ash. Um, not a good place, let's say. You don't want to end up here. If this is eternity for you, you're not going to be 
very happy being crapped out by the bird uh, over and over again. So this this is meant to scare you, and if it does, if you it, it, if it doesn't now, it probably would have then at least. If you legitimately believe in what this artist is representing, um, this is a pretty scary place, and it might be the kind of thing which could compel you to start behaving a little better if you aren't behaving well, if you aren't doing what the church tells you you should be doing. Um, and that's exactly what this is supposed to do. It's supposed to remind you that this is a transitory time, it's going to end soon, and if you act like the people in the middle panel do, this is what you've got waiting for you for eternity. I want to talk about another altarpiece now that, that um, in some ways uses a similar strategy but in other ways is dramatically different, both in how it looks visually, but also in why, how it's doing what it's doing. Um, this is an altarpiece by a German artist named Grunewald. Um, a pretty traditional altarpiece in that the central panel has the crucifixion of Christ on it, which is the, a scene you find most commonly in the central panel. Down below you see Christ has kind of come down from the cross after the fact. Um, this is actually a very complex altar piece that folds into lots of different ways, which I'll show you in just a minute. But um, I want to focus mainly on this central scene and then talk about one other scene in a moment. Uh, here's a, an image of the altar piece in, in the church today, so you get a, a better sense of the scale, uh, at least. Um, but I want to focus on this central scene. Um, this is one of the most violent representations of the crucifixion ever before made. Um, a few years ago when Mel Gibson came out with that movie, The Passion of the Christ, and I don't know if you saw it or not, but there was a lot of controversy around it because there's a pretty gruesome, graphic, violent depiction of the crucifixion in that, in that movie, and when I saw it, I just kept thinking that Mel Gibson has nothing on Grunewald, that the idea of representing the, the crucifixion in a very intense, violent way has a long history, and this is probably the apex of the triangle. Uh, and this is about as gruesome as at least I've ever uh, seen. Um, it's a very violent and gruesome depiction. Uh, as I get up even closer, you'll notice that uh, you know Christ is crowned with thorns uh, in the New Testament, it says. But usually that's a kind of self-contained little round thing you stick on his head. Here, this crown of thorns just spills over his his head onto his shoulders. And not only that, but his entire body has thorns sticking out of it. Uh, and then it just has these uh, essentially pot marks as if there were thorns there before, these little red dots everywhere. His flesh is extremely green and discolored as if, um, uh, you know, death is is not only there, but is taking over his entire body in a very intense way. But everything else about his body says he's still alive. Um, it's extremely emaciated, uh, contorted. Um, notice the way his hands um, really writhe and his fingers strain under the pain of the nails driven into him. And same thing with the feet. Um, the way the feet curl one over the other, stretching and straining and bleeding. Um, a very vicious representation of the crucifixion. Oh, sorry. But now that I've said that, um, sometimes people see this and you're, you're almost repulsed by how violent this is. It seems pretty over the top. But this is one of these arcs, artworks where when you really do situate it in the context it totally changes. Uh, it becomes something entirely different. Um, and so I want to do that for you. So this, this painting was made not to just go in a random church. It was made to go in a monastery that was uh, a special monastery in that it had a section of it which was at the time called a hospital. Uh, but the word hospital would be um, inaccurate, at least from our conception today of what a hospital does. Today, you go to a hospital when you want to get better when you're ill. Uh, in this era, you went to a hospital not to get better, but you went there to die. Um, if you were ill and, and death was imminent, um, you would go to the hospital to live out your last few days. Uh, perhaps so as to not be contagious and get other people ill, uh, but also because... Um, you would have care there, and you want to be in a holy place as you die to kind of improve your chances in the next life. 
Um, so this painting was made for this hospital, and there was an especially specific uh, disease going around at the time when this painting was made called St. Anthony's Fire. It was a strain of the plague, which was uh, particularly uh, violent in that it caused a very gruesome, uh, miserable death. Um, it would cause your flesh to just decay and start peeling off your body. Your, your flesh would start putrefying essentially while you were still alive and you wouldn't die until you got horrible boils and pains on the surface of your skin and it would start to just kind of decay and peel away and eventually after that happened for a while you would die but extremely painful a miserable way to die and so you would have here at this hospital in this monastery um you know hundreds of people sometimes sitting on these beds awaiting this agonizing death going through this terrible pain so I want you to think about that, the difference of how that changes this image. It goes from just kind of reveling in the violence of the crucifixion to something very different. All of a sudden now, what the artist is really doing is not trying to distance Christ from us, which in a lot of ways this violence is so violent, it makes it you know almost inconceivable probably for most of us. Instead, what it is, is it's the artist absolutely trying to make something that connects with its audience. Um, Talked about Leonardo da Vinci, you know, trying to do things that make their his works of art connect with his audience. So he has the little cat squirming away out of the Christ child's hands as he sits on Mother Mary's lap. And that makes it more human because, you know, you've probably held a cat before and, you know, they kind of like to squirm. Um, this is that same thing. It's people whose flesh is decaying, who are in terrible pain and are on death's doorstep looking up and seeing an image of Christ which they understand, which they feel, which uh, they connect with because of the intense pain they're in. This is essentially a painting that is trying to say, Christ knows how much it hurts right now for you, because look what he felt. Um, in some ways, all images of the crucifixion are saying that generally, but this one gets much more intense because it has an audience that is experiencing much more intense pain than your average human being will ever endure. Um, so in some ways, I think this goes from a very violent and almost off-putting image of Christ to when you situate it in a context, there's something I think extremely beautiful about it, about um, an image which is designed really to bring comfort and peace into people's lives because they feel that uh, Jesus has experienced a little bit uh, of what they're experiencing um, and therefore they can look to him for comfort and have faith uh, in salvation. I want to show you now this is if you the Isenheim altarpieces actually has a very complex folding scheme it folds out to a number of different scenes if you fold it a certain way this is what you're presented with I want to focus on this image over here on the right which is the resurrection of Christ. Um, and I want to compare it to a, a, an image of the resurrection from the Italian Renaissance. When discussing the Northern Renaissance, as I've tried to do multiple times, I think it's important to kind of see the way things are, are really conceived in different ways in these two spaces at roughly the same time. So I want to compare this image of the resurrection to one by an artist named Titian, who is part of the Italian Renaissance, where you get this central scene that is basically the same. It's Christ being resurrected, rising from the tomb. So if we look at these together, uh, notice the difference in them and notice how it connects to their respective contexts. With Titian, um, we talked about the things that were important in the Italian Renaissance. Um, bodies that look like they were Greek sculptures, you know, perfect musculature, ideal forms. Uh, Christ basically has the body of a, you know, our, our discus thrower from ancient Greece, um, that kind of perfect body. Uh, artists were studying nude bodies, studying classical sculpture, and then creating that. Um, but Christ looks very normal, other than the fact that he's kind of walking in the clouds and maybe uh, wearing slightly less clothing than your average man would on a normal day. Um, he looks very much like a, a regular human being. Um, 
and not very otherworldly or distant, in contrast to Grunewald's version of Christ's resurrection. I'm going to go back to now so you can see it a little larger. Um, Grunewald's Christ doesn't look, well, he only looks, let's say, vaguely human even. He looks almost more alien than human. Um, his, his head kind of melts away into this giant glowing orb of a halo that his body almost kind of sits in. Um, his flesh has become so intensely white that it's now seeming to just kind of emanate light. His robes flow in this very otherworldly way. Um, this is an image of the resurrection that transforms Christ from a human being when he died on the cross into something very distant and godlike, but very different from us. Whereas Titian's Christ, resurrected Christ still basically looks like a human being. Uh, we don't get that with Grunewald. His becomes something fundamentally different. And that speaks to that difference in the uh, Renaissance conception of God and man being very close, being very connected, being like one another. Whereas in Northern Europe, there is a pretty substantial difference between what God is and what man is. And that's why you should not just try to uh, emulate everything uh, on the world in the world that's happening, but rather you should focus your life on what's ha going to happen in the next life and what you can do here to kind of prepare for that. Okay, um, I want to shift gears now and bring up our next uh, kind of topic because something really dramatic happens um, near the beginning of the 1500s or the 16th century. Uh, which, of course, are the same thing. Just two ways of saying that. Um, and it is something that historians call the Reformation. And a crucial figure in the Reformation is a guy named Martin Luther. Um, so I want to talk about what this is historically, because it's going to have a dramatic effect on not only history, but on art. Um, and I think recognizing it and dealing with it will help uh, us understand everything that's made in art for the next couple hundred years after this point in time. Um, the Reformation, the word Reformation, you can probably see the, the first half of that word is the word reform. And it refers to an attempt to reform the Catholic Church. Um, some people had felt um, that the Catholic Church was doing things in an improper way. And this was an attempt to change the church, to reform it, to make it uh, what they would perceive to be more reflective of the church uh, Christ kind of set up in the New Testament. Um, at least that was the core of lots of the beliefs, turning back to the New Testament saying, we're not quite doing things the way they seem to be doing it there, and we need to change the church um, to make it look that way. Um, now, that attempt to reform the church um, eventually leads to a massive fracturing of the church uh, because the church is resistant to reforming. Um, but I want to back up a little bit to see how we get to this point in time. Uh, we really have to go back to the 1300s uh, where we first have something known as the Great Schism. Um, the Great Schism happens, and I'm not that concerned that you know all the exact dates, even if I mention them. But in the early 1300s, something uh, dramatic happens. Um, Catholicism has a pope at its head. Uh, that pope, not only kind of his seat is in the Vatican in Rome, but the pope traditionally had almost always come from Rome, or at least surrounding areas in what today we'd call Italy. Um, but in 1309, uh, a new pope is uh, elected, and for the first time in history, this is a French pope. He's a person of French descent. Um, and one of the first things the French pope does is he does what all the uh, Roman popes before had feared a French pope would do. He leaves Rome and goes to France and basically moves the capital of um, the Catholic world to a place named Avignon in France. Um, this makes the French very happy. The Romans, not so much. Um, uh, they get very unsettled about um, not only the capital of the, the Catholic Empire basically moving to France, 
but this French Pope starts instituting uh, Frenchmen as all of the cardinals as well. So he kind of starts uh, taking over the, the leadership of the Catholic Church and putting French people in charge. Um, later in that century, uh, a, a, a French Pope, uh, a couple later on, feels kind of guilty and decides to, he feels that that Rome is where the Catholic Church should, the seat of it should be, and so he goes back. Um, but then they have some problems because the French people are uh, very upset with the situation. And once this pope who's gone back to Rome dies, there is a massive controversy. The French uh, cardinals who were in power all elect a new French pope. Uh, the native Roman cardinals say, that guy's not a real pope, we're electing our own pope. And then a independent uh, committee dis dismisses both of these popes, and they elect a third pope. And each of these popes are saying they're the rightful pope, and they each excommunicate all the other popes. And nobody quite knows what to do with this. Uh, I bring up this case because it's, it's the first moment really in Catholic history that shows a, a kind of crack in the system. And the church is predicated largely on the infallibility of the Pope and the leadership of the Catholic Church. And when this event happens, they don't quite seem so infallible. Um, and over the next couple hundred years, there's a number of what are called heretical movements that pop up. People who, you know, pop up and criticize the Catholic Church, say they're doing things wrong. Uh, but the Catholic Church becomes very good at stamping those things out. There's a lot of people who are burnt at the stake. Um, and in all honesty, this is an age before the printing press has rolled around. So even if you have a bunch of big ideas, um, to actually distribute those ideas in any kind of broad way is very difficult. So most of the heretical movements that arise um, prior to the 1500s uh, don't go very far. But then, right about the time we get the printing press, there arises a unique individual who isn't your average uh, churchman, uh, has some unique advantages, and what he starts doing uh, spreads like wildfire and forever shapes the Western world. Uh, and that's Martin Luther. Now, the thing that's unique about Martin Luther is most uh, clergymen are designated as going to the clergy from a very young age. Uh, you might remember this from the Medici documentary, uh, basically, Lorenzo de' Medici picks one of his sons uh, and one of his uh, uh, nephews. And when they're still little kids, they say, all right, you're going to be our our clergyman from our family because there's a lot of power if you're a, a cardinal or a pope. Um, and a lot of people who become influential in the Catholic Church, even people who don't become so, quite so influential, but a, a local bishop or something like that, frequently they're people who enter monasteries at very young ages, maybe because uh, they're orphaned, maybe because um, they're from powerful families and they're placed there to represent their family. But people tend to come from, clergymen tend to come from a long line of, of or, or many years of training within the clergy. This is where Martin Luther is really different and where he has a unique advantage. Uh, Martin Luther is actually a lawyer. He doesn't want to be a lawyer, but um, his father actually basically makes him be a lawyer. His father has a business, and his father kind of wants a lawyer to be on the side of the family business. So he essentially designates Martin Luther as uh, the, the, per the son who will become a lawyer to defend the family business. So Martin Luther's trained not as a clergyman, but he's trained as a lawyer. And when you're trained as a lawyer... You're trained in things like rhetoric, you read Plato and Aristotle, um, you read a lot of non-religious uh, stuff to prepare yourself to be a lawyer. Um, but he has an experience one summer when he's coming home uh, from where he lived to visit his family, and as he's riding home, he gets caught in a storm. And he recounts this storm being so terrible and vicious that he was certain uh, he was going to die, uh, lightning all around him. And uh, he has one of those moments which sometimes 
soldiers recount having on a battlefield when they are in a similar situation and feel for their lives and kind of hunker down and pray to God and say, if you get me through this one, I'll make sure, you know, I'll do every, anything you want me to. I'll turn my life over to God. I will serve you. I'll be really good, whatever you might want to pledge. Uh, Martin Luther basically does that. He says a prayer and says, if you um, get me out of this one alive, Lord, I will serve you for the rest of my life. And right as he finishes this prayer, the clouds part, uh, the storm ceases, and Martin Luther feels that this is a miracle. And he now feels compelled, despite his father's wishes, to enter the clergy. So he enters the clergy after being trained in all of these non-religious uh, ways with a very unique perspective. He gets uh, into the clergy and he starts becoming very disturbed by some of the things that the Catholic Church hierarchy, especially in Rome, are doing. Now this is about the time that you also saw in the Medici documentary movie where we get our first uh, Medici Pope. He starts having giant banquets and feasts and um, he commissions artists like Michelangelo to make uh, dramatic paintings on the Sistine Chapel to totally rebuild St. Peter's uh, Cathedral to um, create giant tombs for his uh, deceased ancestors. And all of those things require money. Uh, now, the Catholic Church has a lot of money flowing into it, but these guys are, uh, these popes are having so much fun and spending so much money that they're way behind on their bills. So basically, the pope needs to figure out ways to increase revenues, to bring more money in. Now, the Catholic Church had had a practice for a long time called the selling of indulgences. And it's basically the idea that if you commit a sin, you can kind of buy your way into forgiveness. So if you commit adultery, if you're willing to donate, uh, you know, $100 to the church, that's the cost of adultery. You no longer have to pay for that sin. This has been a controversial practice for a long time uh, uh, among people throughout the empire for probably obvious reasons um, to say that, you know, rich people can therefore just commit all the sins they want and buy their way out, whereas poor people have to burn in hell for their sins. Some people don't think that's uh, what Christ was really about. Um, so it would have been controversial, and people hadn't liked it. But then they started really ramping this up. Um, they got a lot, of, a lot of money from that for a long time. But then Mar uh, the Pope in Rome starts doing something new. He basically sends out emissaries that would wander through uh, the empire into small villages. They'd come to the small towns and say, uh, we've got a special today <laughs> on indulgences. Uh, it's half price. It's uh, buy one in advance. Uh, get one free. Uh, <laughs> running all these deals to try to up the selling of indulgences. Usually it was done if you if you committed a sin, you could kind of buy your way out. But they went and said, do you even want to commit a sin? If you, if you want to commit adultery but you haven't, we'll give it to you half price. Uh, so you pay 50 bucks and then you're, you're free to go commit adultery and, and you don't have to burn for it. And then they made it even worse and they said, um, we're also starting a new practice and you can buy your ancestors out of hell. So you know your dad was kind of a bad guy and he committed adultery and he didn't have enough money to pay for his sin. Well, for five bucks, you can get him out of hell. And so they start uh, really pressuring people to come up with money to save their deceased you know, fathers and mothers and people. This really ticked off Martin Luther. He was furious at this. He read the Bible and he didn't see in any way, shape, or form how this connected to what he saw in the text of the Bible. Uh, he then decided to make a giant list of all the things he saw in the Catholic Church that bugged him. Uh, and he went down to the church door, and he essentially took his list, and he nailed it to the church door. So a very kind of public act of defiance. And I had a big list of all the things he didn't like about the Catholic Church, um, which we'll talk about a few of them later on, but it's a long list. Um... Uh, and this, he didn't really, he really saw what he was doing again as attempt at reform. 
he wanted the Catholic Church to recognize that he had a good point and change its ways. Um, the Church was unwilling to do that, though, and what happened was it started a movement. And you get people all over and all across Europe uh, breaking off from the Catholic Church and starting their own, what become known as Protestant religions. And the word Protestant, of course, like Reformation at its core, has the word protest. And essentially any church that was founded at this time coming out of a protest towards the Catholic Church and its inability to reform uh, can be labeled a Protestant church. So um, Lutherans, uh, a sect that was uh, founded to follow Martin Luther, even though he didn't really see this as his sect, uh, at least when he started. Uh, Baptists, Methodists, um, all these can fall under the umbrella of Protestant Christian churches uh, because they're all protesting at this moment against the Catholic Church. Now, I want to talk about what this does for art. Uh, and I should say that while Protestantism spreads in lots of places, where it tends to be most successful is in Northern Europe, up here where today we have Germany, um, the Netherlands. Uh, this is the region where Martin Luther came from. It's the region where Protestantism spread most severely. Uh, the United Kingdom, England kind of does its own thing that is Protestant, but only sort of Protestant. Um, uh, whereas Italy, France, and Spain remain largely Catholic and where Catholic Church has control. But over here up in this northern region, um, you get Protestant churches really starting to uh, be in charge uh, and dominate the religious landscape. So, uh, just to sum up, there's a couple things that, that this really changes. Before this moment of the Reformation, and again, we're roughly talking about 1520 to 1525 when the Reformation starts taking hold. Uh, before the Reformation came along, the church was the one thing that kind of bound Europe together. Um, the, Europe was a very fluid place with not a lot of hard borders, um, but a lot of different rulers, a lot of different kings, but they were all Catholic. They all essentially were under the authority of the Pope, and they um, were connected because of that. And therefore, they didn't tend to fight each other quite as often because they were all inherently Catholic. And before the Reformation, I think to notice the church was relatively tolerant. If a, you know, a parish in Germany in some remote village taught things that um, would be considered wrong according to the official Catholic doctrine, they didn't mind that much. They were okay. They, they allowed for a variety of opinions and stances. If you don't like transubstantiation, that's okay. You can still be Catholic. You don't have to like it. Um, but that's going to change after this. So uh, after the Reformation comes along, all those old beliefs in the church and the Pope as infallible, perfect institutions don't really work anymore. Uh, and the other thing that happens is the two sides, meaning Catholics and Protestants, instead of being kind of tolerant, um, they start to see themselves as, as only right and the other side is entirely wrong. And not only right and wrong, but as righteous and evil, as inspired by God or inspired by the devil. And we're going to see this throughout the next few classes that the two sides, Protestants and Christians, start to detest one another's uh, one another on a very intense scale. Um, and it's going to have dramatic impact on the shape history takes in the next few hundred years. So I want to look now at art amongst Protestants. Um, so these are the people, again, who have broken off from the Catholic Church. Now, um, this is a, a print from Hans Holbein, the guy who painted the ambassadors, the one we saw a little bit uh, ago. Um, this is what you might expect Protestant art to look like. Uh, we have this called Tr Christ and the True Light. We have Christ here in the center pointing to the true light. Uh, he is gesturing to his followers who are relatively humble, common people, whereas the people who are dressed in priestly robes and look like monks or bishops or cardinals or the Pope himself um, 
have to turn away from the true light. They're going in a different direction. This is pretty straightforward Protestant art, saying the, the church has kind of lost its way. We are going back to Christ, and Christ will point us to the truth. But this is actually a dramatic exception. This, this kind of art very rarely happens in the, during the Reformation, and there's a really good reason why. One of the things that uh, was on Martin Luther's list of what's wrong with the Catholic Church, and one of the things <coughs> excuse me, that a lot of people saw as problematic in the Catholic Church was all of this spending of money on very lavish things, whether they be dramatic robes or hats or painting ceilings or building giant cathedrals when there's people starving and dying in the streets. That Christianity, uh, Christ, and the New Testament preached a lot of things about helping the poor out. And it seemed like the people in the Catholic Church were blowing a lot of money on stuff when the poor were really struggling. Um, and so that was one of the problems. And that connected, because so much of the money that was spent that people didn't like in the Catholic Church was spent on art, there became to be some new impressions about how art is used in the Catholic Church. Um, and people started wondering, maybe one of the problems with the Catholic Church is that we've let art become too important. And they started to look to the Old Testament. And I'm going to put up a, a passage of Scripture now. This is Exodus chapter 20. This is the giving of the Ten Commandments. So if there's any part you might know from the Old Testament, even if you're not an Old Testament scholar, you've probably heard about the Ten Commandments, at least in theory. Uh, I want to read this because I think it's a really interesting verse of Scripture. Um, so verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Pretty straightforward. Um, verse 4 it gets a little more complex. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. If it stopped there, it'd be straightforward. But it doesn't. It goes on and says, Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. And it says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, and it goes on. Now, if you just isolate, um, if you read the whole thing, it's easy to see how Christianity traditionally and Catholicism said, okay, this is about making graven images that you worship, that you bow down to and you serve, and we don't do that. And they would say, we don't do that. But it's that middle part of verse 4 where it says you shouldn't make any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. That seems slightly more broad. And some people started to wonder if one of the problems with the Catholic Church was that there's paintings everywhere. And the Lord perhaps here is warning that if you are making likenesses of things in heaven or in the earth or in water, you are inherently violating this commandment. And so uh, a lot of Protestant churches, though not all of them, um, start eliminating religious art. If they build a, a church, they don't have any paintings inside it. Um, they start doing things, uh, sometimes going into Catholic church and destroying religious art because they see it as heretical, as counter to what God really wants. Um, so that puts Cath uh, Protestant artists in an interesting position. Uh, religious subjects had made up 99% of their business. Uh, if you're an artist, you painted religion. It was just what you learned to do. It's what people liked. It's where the money was for commissions for art. So that's what you painted. But now, that's what you sculpted. That's what you made prints of, whatever your medium is. But now, churches don't want art. Um, and your big patron, the church, is not commissioning uh, very much art, if any art at all. And that's why um, this might seem like what you'd get, but because of the fear of any image in a lot of Protestant sects, any art like this is really avoided. So, I want to look now at, at some art that comes out in this early phase of the Protestant Reformation, uh, which is still things are in flux. Uh, the Different churches might feel different about this prescription against images, so you might get still some religious imagery, but it starts to change. Now, this is a sad point, because normally what I do with this painting is I get to pay, play one of my favorite games with you in class, but 
it doesn't work so well in an online lecture. Um, uh, since I don't have a title up there, you might have guessed. This is where I play the game Name That Painting. Uh, and this is not a right or wrong answer. I don't really expect you to know the name of the painting. But it's uh, a game I play when I feel that there's sometimes a disconnect between the title and what actually the artist gives you. So what I really ask is, what do you see? If you had to guess what this is a painting about, um, what would you guess if you had to name the subject? And usually people walk through and maybe it's a, some kind of festival or something. There's lots of people. Maybe some kind of procession. They all seem to be kind of... There's those horses and people in red robes kind of moving in one direction. So maybe some kind of um, pilgrimage or procession. Um, sometimes people note uh, that thing in, in the background that's kind of circular. Um, that it seems to be where people are marching towards. So maybe that's where there's a fair or a festival of some kind. Um, sometimes people note in the foreground here you have a few large figures. And there's somebody who seems to be kind of sad and somebody helping the sad person and since these are the largest figures in the scene maybe that is a clue into what it's about now i want to put up the title the artist is a guy named bruegel uh, and the title is the road to calvary and if you know anything about the new testament you might might know that the road to calvary is the road christ takes uh, to be crucified so what this is a painting of is essentially christ walking to be crucified now you might be slightly caught off guard because you'd think in that kind of a subject uh, you would notice where Christ is. I don't know if you've seen him yet or not, but if you follow my pointer, there's a guy here in a blue robe right in the center with a cross on his back. I think I have a, a detail here. Here we go. Here's a slightly more up close detail uh, right there in the middle. Uh, and if you zoom in on this circle in the back, you actually see one, two, three crosses there. So this is the site at which he will be crucified. Now, there's a lot of things you could say about this, and we'll see a lot of religious art in the next few classes. Um, it, this doesn't look very much like a Middle Eastern landscape. <laughs> um, this doesn't look like what it would look like, but that's actually a very common thing to kind of take a biblical event and dress the people up in... Uh, the clothing you wear in your society to um, make it seem like it's more connected to you. Um, I don't think I pointed this out, but if you if you think of Campan's Marode altarpiece, which I showed you last class, that's the one, the first painting we looked at when talking about the Northern Renaissance, where you have um, Mary and the angel Gabriel coming to tell her that she's going to bear the Christ child, and you might remember it because there's that little tiny baby Jesus holding a cross flying in through the window. Um, if you look out the windows uh, in that scene, there, there's windows kind of out to the street. The buildings are buildings from the 1400s in Belgium. They're not buildings that have any connection to the Middle East or anything. And the same thing here, you can even see the architecture back here. This doesn't look like a Middle Eastern landscape, and this clearly, uh, Christ was crucified on this big hill. This isn't anything what it was like. Uh, this is an artist combining a story with familiar elements so people can connect to it. But what I'm more interested in, again, is this impulse to make religious art, but to really hide the religion in it. Um, this is, I think, one of these works where uh, this is what artists do. It's what they're trained to do. It's what they're used to doing. They make religious paintings. But they're painting now in a time where people are starting to frown upon or entirely reject religious art um, as legitimate, uh, and some even seeing it as evil, as inspired of the devil. So you get this kind of Where's Waldo type of religious art, where it is religious, but it's, it's very carefully couched, that the religion is subtle, um, is hidden a little bit, so as to maybe find a kind of middle ground where you can paint religion but not get in trouble. But what really happens more often is stuff like this. This is the same artist. And I, I promise there's no hidden Jesuses anywhere in this scene. Uh, this one is called the hay harvest, and that's what it is. Um, it's people harvesting hay. What we really start to get in Protestant countries is a movement away from overt religious painting, where there's Christ in it, even if he's hidden. Uh, a movement towards art about 
the entirely new things. Um, this one is pretty close to a couple different types of art we'll see a lot of in the next couple weeks. Um, landscape painting, which kind of, you know, what really is about is maybe just all that landscape. And another thing it might be about are just peasants who work. Um, that's a subject that uh, a lot of artists are going to start to take up, kind of average daily life of the peasantry. Um, so in the absence of religion here, due to this new Protestant context, is largely what this painting is about. It's what can I paint now that I can't paint religion? Maybe I'll paint a landscape. Maybe I'll paint people working, doing their jobs. That being said, there are uh, a lot of art historians think that this painting, despite the absence of Jesus or Moses or any traditional religious symbols, still see in this work of art religious meaning. Um, and I want you to think through how that could be. There's a couple possibilities. Um, one of the things we do get in the landscape, we get what appear to be probably two churches. Churches tend to be the only large buildings really at this time. So the fact that we have churches in our landscape might allude to religion, but probably more precisely it has to do with what these people are doing. If you're familiar with the New Testament at all, uh, there's a lot of parables Christ tells about harvesting and about wheat and separating wheat from tares having to do with um, converting people to Christianity, having to do with kind of the, the last days of apocalypse prior to Christ's second coming. There's a lot of talk about harvesting and wheat. Um, and so the fact that that is the subject here is probably not totally coincidental, but that when we get this uh, hay harvest, we get this subject chosen it's because it, it has religious meaning. It connects to religion without crossing that line into dangerous territory. If you paint Jesus, that might be evil. That might be bad. If you paint a hay harvest that alludes to a story Jesus told once, it's harder to see. That's much more acceptable because it, on the surface, the painting is only the hay harvest. So what we get here is kind of two things happening simultaneously. A push into art that is overtly non-religious, that is clearly not about religion, is about landscape, it's about work, it's about the peasantry, whatever it's about. But at the same time, what we get is a kind of need to still do things that have a kind of religious message, if not a, a straight story from the Bible or the crucifixion of Christ. A, a painting that still connects with religious ideals. Because the reality is these Protestant people are no less religious than their Catholic forebears. In fact, uh, some would say a lot of them are more religious. The reason they've left the church is they take it very seriously. Um, and these are people that still want art that somehow reflects their religious life and their religious values, even if they think art depicting Christ might be dangerous. And so this is kind of a middle ground where it's on the surface almost purely secular. It's about landscape and peasants. But underneath that surface, the messages very frequently connect to religion and say something about religious life.